Ambassador, Professor, thank you very much for your kind words and for having me here at this very important forum. I want to recognize the presence of our ambassador, Ambassador Israeli, who was very helpful in uh, running a very intensive and busy schedule, but still for me it's definitely a very interesting experience. And I want to thank basically my hosts here, the president of Overseas Careers Foundation and uh, Ambassador Ma, a longtime friend, who were very helpful in organizing this visit to uh, to your country, to Korea, during these challenging times in Israel. Um, being here among friends, before I go to uh, the presentation, I think I need to make a certain explanation, because uh, sitting in this friendly audience, one may say, why Israel needs Ministry of Public Diplomacy in the first place? Israel is a well-respected well country. Uh, people say, nice things about uh, Israeli startups, Israeli technology, Israeli security. Why would Israel bother having an agency like that? Instead of going into theoretic explanations, and I think in Korea especially you will understand my example, I will tell you a story that happened to me personally about two years ago. <clears throat> I was flying one of the American aircraft companies from uh, Paris to New York. I first had to visit Paris and then proceed to New York. That's how I found my, myself on this American plane. By the end of the flight, one of the flight attendants approached me, a nice American lady, obviously not Jewish. She approached me and said, uh, excuse me, are you really the prime minister of the state of Israel? Well, as an elected official, as a politician, I could give only one answer to that question. What did I say? I said, not yet. <laughs> I said, not yet. Uh, I said, not yet. I'm just one of the cabinet ministers. And then she said, uh, never mind. I just wanted to tell you, sir, that you have a wonderful country. I visited Israel for the first time about three months ago, she said, with two of my friends. They're both pastors. We stayed in the old city in Jerusalem. We visited this and we visited that and people were so nice to us and we felt so safe and I want to come again. And for 20 minutes before the pilot, you know, the announcement said, the cabin crew, please be seated for landing. For 20 minutes, she was bending over me telling wonderful stories about Israel. And I'll be quite frank with you. I didn't know whether to be very proud as a cabinet minister in this wonderful country, or to cry. Because for me, it was absolutely obvious that part of that enthusiasm, of that excitement, was for the reason of very low expectations. That nice lady was traveling to Israel, being absolutely sure that she would come to a war zone. But as a devoted Christian, she wouldn't care. She wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't be afraid Never mind the dangers, she would be able to visit the holy sites. And yes, people will be involved in all kinds of terror attacks and there will be fights in the streets and still she would come and visit. And all of a sudden she finds wonderful surrounding, wonderful country, people who are nice to her, people who are very welcoming. She goes to the Arab quarters, to the Jewish quarters and, and life is going on and no one no one's is shooting each other, you know. This is exactly the reason. I think that we are trying to promote the real Israel, not propaganda of some ideas of this or that Israeli governments, government. Governments, as you know, change in Israel uh, more or less every four years, but to try to present the real picture of Israel. Now, to f finish the forward, we may think how, how come that it happened that Israel, with all the nice things we know about it, is known mostly for explosions and conflicts and things of that time. Well, obviously, it's uh, more or less the result of what, what, makes the, what makes it into the news. Culture, high-tech, Nobel Prizes even, don't make it into the news that much. When something blows up, when there is a conflict, when there are, God forbid, victims, well, once again, in this country, I don't have to explain to, to, to this distinguished audience when, when there is a headline in New York Times about Korea. When a missile flies from, from the other side. And if, God forbid, it hits someone, it's a big headline. So this is more or less the situation. That's, I think, what we are trying to do to show that there are 
different things in Israel happening, different uh, aspects of life that are less known to the world. And in today's world, as we'll, I hope we'll see from the presentation, it's doable. We are not exactly hostages anymore of the traditional media. There are other possibilities. People commute, people talk to each other, people are on the web all the time, people are in social networks, and that's how we are trying to promote different things. Now, I hope I will manage, I always mention that I'm third generation humanities in my family, so I don't necessarily manage with technical things. Uh, organizational structure, we'll get to it. Uh, it. It includes public diplomacy, and it includes diaspora affairs, and uh, part of both, I guess, is fighting combating anti-Semitism and also the issue of Holocaust remembrance, that both issues could be perceived as, as part of the public diplomacy effort. Now, the obvious question would be how much overlapping, because we can't see it on the scheme, how much overlapping there is between the two. And as, as you mentioned, Professor, I think in, in your words, or, or probably it was Ambassador Mars, sorry for not remembering, but uh, uh, there is a, a situation in which Jewish communities around the world could be part of the public diplomacy effort. But at the same time, I wouldn't mix the two. I think that there is special and unique value to our relations with the diaspora Jewish communities, public diplomacy or the image of Israel notwithstanding. And there is the issue of public diplomacy. The fact that many Jewish communities know more about Israel, care more about Israel, and want to present the real Israel they know definitely helps. But I wouldn't, as I've said, you know, totally mix the two. Move from reactive to proactive public diplomacy via human resources and unofficial public diplomacy and effective, effective unofficial diplomacy. What I'm trying to say here is something that is very difficult for me to say in this audience with all the ambassadors and professors and myself being a cabinet minister, but in this topsy-turvy world we live in today, the real source of information in the eyes of many is not someone who has a suit and a tie and uh, appears on the TV and says certain things about his country. Because the moment I appear on the TV and under my face there is the title, Yuli Edelstein, Israeli Minister of Public Diplomacy, the normal reaction is, hey, don't they pay him for saying all these things? That is his position. That is his job. That's why he's saying all that. When a young student has a cup of coffee or a glass of beer with his peer on, on the campus, this is totally different. He doesn't have any invested interest. He or she is the source of information. That's what we are trying to reach, as we'll see in a minute through different uh, uh, programs. The first project we uh, had in Israel as a ministry, by the way, I never mentioned that, but it's a newly created ministry. Three and a half years in the beginning of this term, Prime Minister Netanyahu created the ministry and uh, gave me the honor to have this portfolio. Uh, Resource shortage, obviously, we can't send ambassadors uh, in addition to wonderful diplomats that we have in many countries, including this country. We can't send 100 additional people, officials, who would deal with, with diplomatic efforts, with diplomacy. Uh, Bottom-up people diplomacy, meaning that uh, we, are, we were trying to encourage Israelis, ordinary Israelis, when traveling, when talking to people from different countries, uh, uh, to, to get more involved, more engaged in a conversation about Israel, meaning about their personal life, which was a pretty new concept. We, crea we created a website uh, with more information about Israel's achievements, facts and figures. It turned out that many people go into this website for information. We had millions of unique users, and uh, what was especially to my liking was the fact that uh, that uh, 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 the average time spent by a unique user the web is uh, six and a half minutes, meaning that people are really looking for information. They just wouldn't click and say, oh, that's not interesting, and go out. Uh, these are the, the uh, figures about, about the site. Uh, and uh, I think that the, uh, having all the distinguished professors in the audience, I can say that the the uh, problem here, sorry, we'll go back, I guess. Uh, the problem here is how do you uh, evaluate, how do you estimate the, the results? I know that uh, uh, nearly two and a half million people visited. 
I know that uh, we had, uh, uh, in uh, cooperation with Israeli uh, uh, air companies, uh, we had in the airport little stands by, Neil, uh, by every gate where people could pick up uh, a brochure for the plane with all kinds of facts and figures, basically the same type, uh, the same type of the brochure that, that we see here, and uh, read it while on the plane and use it uh, uh, during the, their trip. I know that uh, thousands and thousands of these little brochures were taken. How do I know that people really did something about it? This is something, by the way, probably one of the subjects for a future conference on public diplomacy, and I know that our good friend Professor Eitan Gilboa spoke about it to this distinguished forum. This is one of the challenges that we still have, how, we can, how can we measure success or lack of success, action or lack of action with these popular projects where millions of people are supposedly involved. That's, that's something uh, uh, that we will still have to work on. Uh, just mind you, for your experience here in Korea, uh, in Israel, for at least first half year, the newspapers and, and many people too had a good laugh at our expense. It was a totally new idea. People were very critical. They said they didn't appoint you Minister of Public Diplomacy in order for you, for you, for you not to do things and, and, and basically tell us to do things. And we were also criticized for the quote-unquote communist approach. How do you expect your citizens to go and do things? Uh, they are free people. They are not... Uh, by the way, this is not... I'm not saying that cynically. This was a very serious remark. That's why we are very careful not to introduce the government position into these, uh, into these facts and figures and information brochures, because in Israel, as in any democratic country, tomorrow the situation may be that one of the opposition members of Knesset, members of parliament, tomorrow will be in my shoes, and then what will inevitably happen, he, will th happen, he, will, he or she will throw away all the materials, and then there will be a totally different public diplomacy campaign, and the result, the target audience will be even more confused about Israel than, than it is today. So we are trying to be as non-partisan as possible in our efforts. Um, campuses. Why, once again, I, I don't even have to explain to you, it's not just uh, nice young people we want to talk to, it's, uh, uh, it's the future participants of forums like that. It's the future members of parliament and editors of newspapers and successful businessmen, and not in, in 50 years from now, probably in 10, 20 years from now. And I think that uh, here uh, we tried to have a special, special effort on different campuses. By the way, uh, we are not uh, the only guys on the block there. Those who are trying to undermine Israel uh, defined campuses as their first target audience. And uh, I hate to say it, but a lot of petrodollars are being spent uh, on different campuses, especially in North America, in order to explain to the younger generation that Israel is a terrible country. I don't want even to repeat all the definitions of Israel, but uh, there we do have to deal with an with a well-organized effort or certain forces to even to pass all kinds of resolutions in the University Senate about boycotting Israel and things of that kind. Well, this is just a nice picture with the Prime Minister just, I guess, to show and to boast that these young people who had no idea that they were that important, they were just ordinary young people representing different parts of the Israeli society after their successful mission were received by the Prime Minister of the State of Israel in order to show them and to show the others that this effort is very well appreciated by the government. Though I do have to say in, in brackets that uh, I can uh, pretty accurately say that most of these young people didn't vote for the prime minister and his party. They came from different sectors of the Israeli society and we were trying to be very pluralistic. By the way, uh, some of these people you see in the picture are even not Jewish. This boy with glasses in the middle is part of the Druze minority. Next to him, as you see, is a, is a Jewish girl from Ethiopia, of Ethiopian origin. And by the way, all these things that are, I guess, well known to many people in this room uh, were a big secret on the Ivy League universities uh, in the United States. To see a black Israeli, to see a non-Jewish Israeli, how come we didn't know these things existed? So for us, that was part of the uh, presentation. Uh, 
well, it's just the reports about the activities I went. Uh, once again, just examples of people who uh, started what when we were young we used to call it uh, pen friends today i guess this expression is hard to explain but they are uh, friends on on social networks and uh, uh, a, a student from one of the arab countries asked for more information to write the thesis on the middle east from one of the israeli peers things unheard of i guess and they would never happen if it were not for that uh, informal context that uh, that people had Uh, here we uh, 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 started uh, a program in, in a certain, this, this I would use just an example uh, uh, of treating a certain region. I wouldn't uh, hide from you that in uh, South America of late uh, with uh, uh, the activities of namely Iran and also some other countries that are not very favorable, favorite towards Israel, the situation, and with certain countries' political leadership they have these days, there was a, a need for a special effort. And uh, uh, we uh, started the first with the seminar of, uh, of the leaders of different Jewish communities, and then they expanded it to the things that you see here. Um, uh, bringing uh, journalists to Israel, bringing media experts to Israel, bringing academics to Israel in order to expose uh, Israel to, to Spanish language media. Uh, by the way, uh, by doing so, what we got is their reaction, probably this is also something to keep in mind. I don't think that most of them felt they were, uh, they were doing a big favor to Israel. They did it in their best interest because obviously the Jewish communities were the first one to suffer when there were anti-Israel demonstration, anti-Israel activities. The protests, if I can call it protests, that would take place would take place not necessarily across the street from the Israeli embassy, which is also uh, well guarded with a lot of security and the local police don't like demonstrators next to an embassy, but a synagogue, a Jewish school, uh, some kind of Jewish institution could easily be a target of these protests that in some cases even turned violent. I hate to say that, but that was the situation. Uh, I uh, uh, think that, that here, uh, this is something, I guess, this is more of an Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli example. And this is also, uh, I don't know, I'm not an expert on Korea, I don't know how relevant it is. Part of the problem that we had in the beginning with the efforts of public diplomacy was that many people said to us, yeah, uh, uh, I, we, we, know we, are, we know you're trying, we know you're trying to do things, but it's really not worth it. The whole world is against us, you can't reach anything, and uh, you know, people already got used to the situation that Israel is a kind of like a nice object to beat when there is uh, something going on, so why bother? Why bother? That was a terrible attitude. People were, it's like, you know, sometimes it's like some kind of a football team that appears at the stadium knowing in advance that it's going to lose. No, no fighting spirit. So this is just an example I can uh, proudly present. Uh, uh, the warmongers, I mean software war, not real war, uh, um, started first a third intifada page on Facebook. And then they moved to Apple to uh, an application on, uh, on, uh, uh, in Apple Store. And uh, uh, it was more or less a, a well-organized call, mostly in the Arabic language, to start violent activities against Israel. And when I wrote the letter to first Mark Zuckerberg, once again, I'll be brutally honest, mostly there was a, a, an outburst of laughter. People said, sure, Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Facebook, would immediately react to what some Israeli minister has to say and will immediately close down the page of the Third Intifada. Ha, ha, ha. And that's exactly what happened. And not because I knew how to scare Mark Zuckerberg and not because he's a personal friend. I don't know him personally. But I think what this example shows that these violent things 
are not part of the ideology, neither of Facebook, nor of uh, Apple, nor of anyone else. These places, wonderful inventions, were not created in order to become a scene of, uh, of calls for violence. By the same token, they don't want uh, pornography or things of that kind there. They don't want violence there. So the moment you properly bring the attention of, the, of their leadership to the fact that things that are not proper are going on there, they, uh, they react. First, as I've said, Facebook and then Apple. We have to be very careful about it. Because if we would start introducing our, once again, ideological ideas here and start trying to close down legitimate criticism or legitimate pages, then we will have a very bad name. But once it's really about violence, I was very happy to see the uh, reaction there. This is the example with Apple. Uh, once again, I'll go personal here. We supported a seminar in one of the academic institutions, probably known, academic institutions in Israel, probably known to some of you, Herzliya Center, uh, um, a seminar for young journalists from different countries to learn about Israel. It was, once again, we didn't even deliver any lectures there. It was totally academic. And uh, I was in the European Parliament last January, and I uh, had a tough interview with a tough lady from one of the European channels, nice lady, she was tough on me in terms of the questions and whatever. And then when we finished, she said, by the way, Minister, I, I'm going to Israel soon. I said to her, yeah, how come? She said, I have some friends there. So where do you have friends from uh, in Israel? She said, oh, I was at this uh, seminar in the Yerzliya uh, Center, a mixed seminar. She didn't have first idea that it was even somehow government <laughs> supported, and we, of which I was very glad. It means that we managed to have the academic nature, not propaganda nature for that seminar. So, uh, uh, so uh, at least, you know, we could see the results that uh, she was definitely, as I've said, honestly, she was tough in her questions, but it was, she was very well informed. And she wouldn't ask nonsense, qu nonsense questions about the conflict about Israel because of the information she managed to get during that seminar. Uh, This is just some figures that we were trying to get vis-a-vis -vis the diaspora activities and public diplomacy. Uh, seminars meaning mostly, definitely, it's not me or my staff coming to lecture, but we were trying more to give uh, training to people in all the subjects that we were discussing. Well, this is just one of the events, event that kind of revived itself, probably also relevant to people if we think of public diplomacy here or overseas Koreans Foundation, the Israel Day Parade that we, by the way, it kind of died out. And a couple of years ago, we decided that it was wrong. And we started reviving it under a different name. And today, is, uh, it is, as you see, Celebrate Israel Parade. It's not a protest. It's not because someone's attacking Israel. It's celebrate Israel with as much culture and achievements and young people as one can see. Obviously, tongue-in-cheek, I would notice that when, the, when there are dozens of thousands of people appearing, all the local leadership appears. You see the mayor of New York here, all the members of the municipal council, congressmen, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's really a celebration uh, in the middle of Manhattan, celebration of Israel, actually. Well, don't have much to add to this one. This is, by the way, still another initiative of the ministry that uh, is, uh, as I've said, it's a separate department, but for us it's very important uh, because, unfortunately, what we are witnessing is that uh, anti-Semitism is not disappearing, even in great democratic countries in Europe, in North America. And uh, instead of just, you know, uh, in the traditional way, being uh, Jews worried about anti-Semitism, we created... A, an international body, interparliamentarian coalition to combat anti-Semitism. Uh, most members are non-Jewish members of parliament from different countries. And as uh, one of the great friends of mine, a member of the British parliament, John Mann, always says, uh, you know, he kind of, uh, in his own words, 
paraphrases a phrase that we use in Israel sometimes, that it always starts with Jews, it never ends with Jews. So basically all these members of parliament are not there just to help the Jews. They're there to make sure that in their countries there will be no xenophobia, no racism, no, no hatred, and uh, combating anti-Semitism for them is something that they are doing in order to, in order to uh, prevent all these terrible events from, from the public conversation in their countries. This is, uh, well, this is Stephen Harper. I will skip uh, the Canadian Prime Minister speaking to our conference of uh, ICCA. Uh, once again, where protests work, there was a terrible coincidence. On the International Holocaust Memorial Day, they wanted to start screening of all possible places in Germany, a movie that uh, was, uh, among other things, very anti-Semitic, and with a touch of Holocaust denial, and uh, thank God we managed to persuade, once again, not the German government, but those who were in charge of trying to screen the movie not to do that. Uh, different activities. As you can see, what is interesting probably here, that activities may be totally different, and here is, once again, with all the experts in the room, uh, I don't think that there would be a one-liner definition of what public diplomacy really is or what the kind of activities uh, we need. There's nothing terrible about it. I mean, something like, for example, lingua, language, doesn't have a, a scientific definition, but we all uh, uh, can go to any university and study linguistics. So it's not that terrible that there is no one-liner one -liner definition here. But different activities, I guess, combined uh, show... Uh, the possibilities that we have. <coughs> to sum up, I would, I would really say that the main challenge uh, here is uh, exactly as, as I mentioned when we, we saw the previous uh, picture, is to uh, persuade people that all kinds of things, sometimes not even directly related to, to, to each other, combined could contribute, could present a different image of any country, in my case Israel, but we are talking here about any country. In Israel, once again, I would say on a personal note, it's a very hot issue. People feel in some cases that it's so not fair. Well, Ambassador Mar, I guess, came across it during his service in Israel. We are a democracy, a long-standing democracy in a very tough neighborhood. We never betrayed the democratic values. We treat minorities in our country properly. We do this and we do that. And how come that they criticize us? How come that when we do, I don't know, something very minor, they, they, the, the criticism is much higher than when, uh, pardon me for the example, but when Assad kills 200 his, of his own citizens in a day? How come that there is this unfair attitude? So it's a very hot issue. When, when it's so sensitive to many people, everyone has a great idea what exactly should be done in order to change the situation. It's like people are very emotionally involved. And when someone has a great idea that if we, pardon me for being so not serious, but if you, we all, whatever, stand in one, on one foot and wave an Israeli flag, then the world would love us. Everyone comes with a specific idea. So part of the effort is to say, your idea is great. But there are other things too. And what someone else is doing is no less important than probably what, what you are suggesting. To have a variety of activities, a variety of, of things that, that could and should be done in order to, uh, to improve the situation. And the last but never least would be something that I started with, this combination of, of uh, diaspora activities and public diplomacy. Roughly speaking, I would say that we in the ministry divided it into three. We first of all turned, as, as you noticed, we turned to Israelis, to those who live in Israel and are citizens of Israel. And we said to them, when you're traveling, when you're talking, when you have guests, when you, when, uh, when you are on the web, please remember your life, your experience is of great interest to people. They just don't know that there is life, ordinary life. Talk about it. Talk about things you are doing. 
that was the first. Then the Jewish communities, and you notice some of the seminars, some of the activities. By the way, in both cases, with Israelis and, and uh, with the Jewish communities, we provided some training. In Israel, for example, we, uh, free of charge, offer training to every delegation, whatever it might be. It could be municipality delegation tra traveling to a twin city. It could be sports club traveling for some competition. It could be a high-tech firm going to some conference. We provide several hours, not a great whatever, but, but several hours of training of how, mostly how, not facts. We can't teach about Israel in five or six hours, but how to talk, how to get involved in a conversation, how to listen and not just to talk, something very important for Israelis to know. And, and, uh, and uh, these things are, uh, I think that, that uh, in Israel alone about 4,000 people went uh, through this training in the last couple of years, and <coughs> the diaspora communities I already mentioned. And the third phase is Friends of Israel in different parts of the world. We have many, we have numerous friends, organized and non-organized, and we are trying also to provide information and to encourage to get involved in these activities. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm all here for you if you have remarks or questions. Thank you.